So today, the topic is vulnerable infrastructure and black and grey swan events. Uh, the lecture will take up around 45 minutes and then we will have around 50 minutes Q&A. So if you have uh, interesting questions, feel free uh, to ask them, of course. And um, today we really want to look into the idea that sometimes it becomes very evident that we live in a very vulnerable society. More recently, that became very clear with the Nord Stream uh, gas pipelines, uh, the leaks uh, that um, yeah, occurred there. And as we use technology more and more in many domains of our society, we, come very, we become very dependent on the complex technological infrastructures that we made. How should we actually prepare for such uh, unlikely events, but when they occur, events with very grave uh, consequences. Someone who can tell us more about this is here today. Uh, it's Professor Henk Ackermans. He's the chair in the supply chain management department at the Tilburg School of Economics and Management. And his research, his research focus is the technical innovation uh, driven sectors, but also healthcare and public infra infrastructure. So please give a big applause to Professor Henk Ackermans. Thank you. Oh, these nice. Thank you. Uh, good uh, late afternoon, good evening, what shall we say? Um, it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to uh, walk you through uh, some pretty horrible stuff, uh, but uh, the pleasure is not from the horrible stuff, but from the lessons that we may learn from this together. Uh, this uh, lecture does not end with an explanation uh, mark like this is the right answer. There are quite some question marks in between as uh, you would expect from a university professor and also from a uh, course on uh, Studium Generale. There are very few definite answers. But with that disclaimer, let me see if I can start. Is this then the next one? Yeah. Okay, so this is the picture that uh, Hannah uh, was, well, at least the picture is, uh, uh, shows what Hannah was talking about. This is what you could see on the top uh, uh, from the sky, uh, gas uh, bo uh, bubbling uh, from uh, the bottom of the sea where some broken uh, gas pipes lay. Um, and, uh, and this was then, I suppose, the trigger for asking me to tell a bit more about this. Um, the... The whole title is not just critical uh, infrastructure, but also grey and black swans. And I'll tell more about those swans later on. But let's start with something. Yeah, let's start with this one. That's a very nice, free, uh, sunny, friendly picture. Uh, does anyone know where, uh, where this is? It's not far away from here. No frequent, long-time Tilburg residents, apparently, because, uh, uh, where should I point there? Oh, ah, a bit closer. Okay, this is swimming pool Stappenkoor in Tilburg. So uh, this is uh, uh, on the other side of the city, so perhaps 15 minutes by a bicycle uh, and 20 minutes by car. Um, and uh, it's on a sunny day. Uh, this is a very happy place, it seems, but it was a very... Uh, Unhappy place. Well, that's too much. That's another. In October 2011. What happened then indoors? Uh, uh, children were playing there. You also have the uh, kikkerbadje, so the low uh, pool for the, for the small children. Uh, and uh, a mother was there playing with her baby. Uh, and out of uh, the top of uh, the ceiling came falling down a large bit of sound equipment. It killed the baby and the mother was severely injured. Uh, that's of course incredibly sad. Um, what's the reason? Well, obvious reason uh, is um, why did it come down? There was no act of sabotage. 
as, as you would expect. No, no, as, as, as we think there has been with, uh, with Nord Stream. No, actually, there was a simple thing like corrosion or roost in, 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 in Dutch. So these, uh, the, this equipment is attached uh, to, uh, uh, to the ceiling with, with the bolts, and those bolts, uh, they are uh, made of metal, and metal corrodes over time. And of course, when it corrodes, especially tends to corrode in acid environments, like with the chloride coming up from the, and hot environments with a lot of moisture, precisely the kind of environments you expect, uh, you know, that are present in, in, a, pa in a pool. So technology killed the baby. Uh, no, not quite, actually. Uh, well, indeed, yes, but uh, um, we'll return to, that, to this one in a minute, but uh, here's a more spectacular uh, one. This is Grenfell Tower, uh, and last week uh, in the UK, it's, it's in a fancy area of, of uh, London, Last week, uh, uh, the, the report came out uh, which claimed that all the deaths that occurred here, and you can see that not everybody will come out of this alive, uh, 72 of them, they were all 72 avoidable. The, 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 uh, yes, of course, in the end, there is a technological cause. Eh? So there was uh, uh, the, 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 the floor uh, uh, was, was, uh, the, was uh, susceptible to, uh, uh, to flames, and there was a lot of deferred maintenance, maintenance not done on time. Uh, but like in the Tilburg case, all this had been known. In the tilburg stappegoor case, uh, it had been known for quite some time that these things needed to, that, that, this, uh, that these bolts needed to be replaced, uh, but it didn't. In the end, uh, there was even an order to put a, to, to, uh, to uh, the, a purchase order to replace it, and we now know that this uh, that that, uh, that that cost 495 euros to replace those bolts by better ones, that could act, well, at least new ones. Uh, but it was cancelled by one department because it's, uh, they said, well, that's the responsibility of the other department. And when you're in this field of maintenance and asset management like I am, you can sort of understand it because what part, so uh, if, if a wall falls down, that's the department, that's the, the responsibility of the public affairs, of the part that builds buildings. But, of course, if, I don't know, if the toilets uh, flow over, then that's not the responsibility of the, part of the company that builds it, but the one that operates it. And now sort of uh, changing uh, bolts is sort of a, a boundary area. Anyway, 10 years later, nobody has still been convicted for this. Uh, there have been some lawsuits, etc. Uh, with Grenfell Tower, uh, the same uh, thing, basically. So what you see is that an I, there is a tip of the iceberg thing. So these technological infrastructures, they of course in the end physically collapse and cause uh, human lives uh, in, in, in these examples and not yet in Nord Stream as far as we know, uh, because of some thing in the physical world, a technical cause. But in the end it's often the way that we organized the management of these technical infrastructures that they collapse. In the case of Stappegoor, uh, the swimming pool, a, 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 uh, yeah, an unfortunate combination of, uh, of, uh, delegate of responsibilities where there was not an overlap, but there was an overlap really, but, but who is to blame for that? In Grenfell Tower, repeated requests, etc. I can't go into every individual detail there, but again, it was well known that there was deferred maintenance, that it was dangerous, that, people complained, that, that there were complaints, but nobody did anything. Uh, so, in the end, it was humans, it was organization that led to a situation in which atoms, in which, uh, so the physical world actually led to a disaster. Uh, so, underneath the tip of the iceberg is a whole deep uh, area of culture, attitudes, cognition, uh, the soft side, the, the part of, uh, of, of society where, uh, where we in this university uh, focus on mostly. Uh, that in the end led to the uh, collapse of, this, uh, of these structures. Uh, is that also true with Nord Stream? Yeah. If, I wouldn't be surprised. So this, I know, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this particular area. I do not know if we've had a sabotage 
or uh, a conscious uh, demolishing of critical infrastructure. Uh, of course, we had it in the medieval ages, etc. But did, do we have, uh, have we had that in the last 50, 60 years? Were there, have there been people that have said, you know, we should uh, reinforce these structures better because they may be uh, subject to terrorist attacks and have, been, have they, those concerns been known and other internal reports and people neglected them because that's too costly? I don't know yet. And perhaps they aren't and perhaps we'll never find out. What is important, I think, in terms of a difference between this case and the two previous ones is that this is what they call a black swan event, I think. And a black swan event, well, the, 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 the name comes from uh, Nicholas Taleb, uh, a writer on risk. And, uh, and he calls this uh, very, uh, uh, that it's, it's a name that sticks. The idea was that for a long time people thought uh, swans are white. So there is no such thing as a black swan. That can never happen. And then and, and, and Talab specialized this black swan event is an event that is extremely unlikely to happen. But on the other hand, when it happens, it's explainably, uh, completely explainable why it happened. And the risk management uh, literature people talk about low high likelihood, high impact events. So the thing is this, you could say that it could have been a meteorite that, that came from the sky and hit, uh, and hit us and nobody knew about this. For now, this has happened only once in our current memory. I'll return to memory later on. So it doesn't seem like there's an organizational uh, issue underlying this technical failure. Yeah, warfare. Probably, but, but we'll just have to find out. There are several examples later on where initially it seemed like, oh, this is just a very unfortunate accident. And later on, actually, the 737 MAX of Boeing, I'll, I'll return to that one, turned out, ah, actually, some oh, very different things were happening there. If I don't look you all in the face, it's because I can't see a thing when I look there because of the lights. They are pretty much in my face then. So this black swan, uh, well, Perhaps uh, in many cases, like the Stapagor and Ever, perhaps they were, sorry for my uh, clumsy uh, uh, or thing, perhaps they were gray swans. And gray swans uh, are also mentioned by Talib, and those are things still very unlikely, but we've seen them before. They happened before. Uh, and in living memory, uh, only so long ago that we've almost forgotten about them. Uh, and how long? Yeah, that depends. For us, uh, COVID, uh, last time we had that, we have to go back to the big uh, uh, influenza of uh, after the first uh, big war. But for Asia, SARS, etc., was a living memory. Perhaps not surprising that, that, in, uh, that in Asia, the preparations uh, for uh, the reaction to COVID was a lot faster than, than, than with us. So a great one is something that rarely happens and still very unlikely, but we've seen it and, and, uh, before, and you could take measures for this. So uh, deferred maintenance in, in department buildings, pretty sure it happened before. Uh, uh, the, 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 also uh, the uh, incident with Stapagora, I'm pretty sure if you look long ago, there are many corrosions in dents. Indeed, I think in the process industry of all major incidents in the Netherlands in the last 15 years, 30% have been caused by corrosion at least. So that's, that's of course, an industrial area, but we know that stuff rusts. Uh, here's another famous example. You look at Long Island, it's almost three miles wide. Well, and, and that's why it's called Three Mile Island, I think. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this was an accident, serious accident. And it could have been so much worse. That in fact, if you, uh, if the, the later on the analysis of this leads that we were half an hour away from a meltdown of all these, these cores. One or two of them actually had a, a really big problem. And some two million people around this area, it's in New York. Uh, no, sorry, it's in Pennsylvania. And we'll, we'll get to New York. Uh, is um, uh, uh, the, the, the received a higher doses than they should have of radioactive material. But the, the, we came so close, and again, a combination of uh, bad luck. Sure, there are, whenever these disasters occur, 
There's never one thing that goes wrong. There are usually two, three things that go wrong at the same time. Each of them pretty unlikely, their combination even more unlikely. But always is there also, uh, they could have in retrospect been prevented if some organizational measures, countermeasures would have been taken. Uh, the word for this is the Swiss cheese model. Don't have a picture of a Swiss cheese. But the idea is that that uh, when something uh, bad happens, so let's say here we've got a screen and like a Swiss cheese there are some holes in it and if you try to throw stones through it, then the likelihood that it goes precisely through that hole is not so big. If you put another screen behind it with again different holes in different ways, the, the likelihood that it will go through both holes is even smaller. A third hole, that's the Swiss cheese analogy. So yes, every individual layer of defense both managerial, training of people, etc., has, has, has uh, technical uh, measures, has its limitations, but combined they make it so safe that, uh, uh, that the likelihood that something will happen is really, really small. Uh, and here we got pretty close. So um, this analysis of this island uh, led uh, an, uh, an American uh, sociologist, is it James or Charles Perrow? Hey, let me check. Charles, Charles, thank you. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce you, Akil Bartwai. Um, uh, uh, not only the man who knows all the names and all the books, but also uh, my collaborator in most of the research that, uh, that, uh, that I'm about to present here in the, in the coming uh, slides. Uh, so this Mr. Perro, uh, uh, from his analysis of this, uh, of, of this incident, came to the conclusion uh, of uh, what they called tightly, uh, sorry, first of all, he said accidents will happen. Uh, whenever these, these infrastructures are so complex that sooner or later, if you wait long enough, uh, something will go through these various uh, Swiss cheese defensive layers. And an actual, uh, it's unavoidable. The more, he said, as, uh, as these kind of technical infrastructures become what he calls closely uh, tightly coupled. So this is an example of a tightly coupled infrastructure. All those bulbs, uh, this is uh, the, how do you call it, the thing in Brussels? Uh, sorry? Atomium. Atomium, thank you. If you would, uh, if one of these balls breaks down, the whole thing comes down, probably. If you put the balls nicely next to each other on the ground, then probably nothing will happen. That, that would be a loosely coupled infrastructure. And his point is that our technological infrastructure, like a power, nuclear power plant or uh, indeed an aeroplane or uh, a, a chemical plant, or these are closely, uh, tightly coupled infrastructures with very little redundancy that they can compensate. By the way, a plane is full with redundancy, but let's not digress too much. He said, in tightly coupled systems, uh, accidents will happen. And uh, the thing is that Akil and me, we agree with Mr. Perro, but for a different reason. We agree that accidents will probably happen, but not for a technical, but probably an organizational reason. Now, that's maybe because we're organizational researchers, but we'll uh, return to that. So, there is a thought that these kind of incidents will happen. Well, take Nord Stream. It's a very long interconnected hundreds of kilometers of pipes on the bottom of the sea. Sooner or later, something might would happen. If not this case, then perhaps some, some machine uh, that uh, tries to install a, uh, that, that's busy doing something totally different, but has some dredging equipment uh, uh, over the floor, or it, it, it's uh, trying to uh, install uh, part of, uh, uh, of a uh, offshore wind farm. You don't know, something may happen. Um, and, and the idea was, well, we'd better get ready because this will happen every now and again. Uh, we have to talk about humans because in a lot of these incident, uh, accidents, uh, there, that starts with a human uh, mistake, an error. And, and so the idea is if we automate more, then we can take away many of these incidents. And that is true if you look at the beginning of what they call the human factors field, then you would have two switches in a plane and the one was meant for going up and the other one was almost the same but for something else. 
And, and after a while, there was another type, type of planes where these buttons were clearly separated. The pilots that only flew one type of plane crashed much more often because they, mis they, they, they mistook those two arrows, which is, uh, which, I, which is something that I would do, those two buttons. So there is much to be said for human errors in many cases. Still, after 50, 60 years of commercial flying, a half of the cases of fatal uh, uh, incidents in the, uh, in the aerospace uh, is attributed to human error. Sure. Uh, but humans can also be heroes. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, who knows where this is? Thank you. Thank you, indeed. Yeah. Well, you can't join, actually. You know the story. That's cheating. I was there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, in the plane? No, who are you? Oh, on that day. Okay, well, it's still a big place, still bigger than the hell of Netherlands, but still. Okay, I see your point. Indeed. Now, well, why do I put this uh, slide here? Well, you've got humans as a hazard, but you've got those humans as heroes. So, if we uh, say, ah, it's all caused because people make stupid mistakes, and let's, uh, then let's not forget that this, in this case, the pilot was a hero in, in, in avoiding a fatal disaster by landing uh, his plane not, uh, uh, well, crashing it, uh, but, crashing, but, but landing it more or less on water, uh, which is great. So we can't just say now it's individual humans who have cognitive problems and mistakes, although many of these big accidents uh, are caused by that. Uh, there is recently uh, some new evidence on the, the, the crash of uh, the Air France plane that came out of uh, Brazil. And a couple of, lots of unlikely accidents, which, uh, incidents which in the end led to the complete loss of the plane. But humans can also be heroes. So humans are heroes, a hero, a hazard. I'm, I'm quite hesitant to, uh, to say now it's, it's the people that have done that. So that doesn't really do it for us, I think. Uh, so it's not technology. We said that in the beginning, technology is what fails. But uh, if it's, uh, and, and to some, the more complex the technology becomes, the more likely it is if you don't take countermeasures that it will collapse because people don't, well, there are so many opportunities for, for these unlikely events. Uh, humans can make mistakes, but they can, only fix, can also fix great things. So I, I put that in as a neutral factor. But now the real problem is, I think, drift. And this is uh, my uh, attempt at, at, at making a, finding a picture of drift. So drift is gradually moving step by step. And, and that's, uh, and what is drift? Well, dri um, uh, let's take this example. Uh, if, uh, so Akil uh, can't say anything. Who knows what this could be? It's uh, not in New York. Well, okay, it's in the Gulf of Mexico. Deepwater Horizon, another great movie. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, happened in the 2010. And, and what you see then is that uh, we have to talk about uh, regulators and operators. So all these dangerous industries in the aerospace, in the, in the nuclear energy, uh, also, by the way, in the, the transportation of gas, for us that's uh, gas unie, but they weren't involved in the, in the, in the Nord Stream directly, uh, not in that part at least, uh, have their uh, oversight. So, uh, because they are so dangerous, we have found companies or institutions that actually look at if they work correctly. Uh, the thing is, though, that these people that have to keep the oversight, they work together, they are... They come from the same school. They have a similar background. It's a job, you know, it's not their life. Uh, their agency also has, uh, is often funded by the industry or at least uh, different parts of the government that uh, subsidizes. Says, yeah, but we also need to make progress in the industry and we also have to have technological progress. So uh, it's very difficult for a regulator to really keep being a very annoying pain in the backside. Uh, uh, the, um, 
uh, there gradually you get more and more collaboration. And collaboration is good. Hey, before you stand somebody who has a majority of scientific publications on the joys and benefits of collaboration, how wonderful that is. Check me out. Uh, but sometimes it does more bad than good, especially when in this role of regulator and operator. So the uh, regulators in this case, uh, they, they, they agreed with too much. Some of the safety systems were turned off because they gave warnings too often. Of course, perhaps false warnings. What is a false warning anyway? But still, uh, several of the, there were many risks taking in the drilling activity. Uh, well, see the movie and, and, and you'll see uh, much more of that detail. So uh, Deep Water Horizon is an example, I think, of too much collaboration, too much collaboration, not I think, we think, Achille and me, between, uh, the, uh, between the companies actually running the, this operation and the, companies and, and the institutions keeping the oversight. It's also uh, true of uh, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, horrible uh, burning uh, 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 apartment building earlier on at Glenfall. Also there, the, 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 the institution that had to keep the oversight were negligent. And that, by the way, uh, also true of uh, the Stappegoor, uh, there uh, the swimming pool, there the, um, um, uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the investigators found uh, an urgent notice, uh, the third one in a row, that really this thing needed to be fixed immediately. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, there was a physical inspection and initially the people at the swimming pool, we talk Tilburg here, eh? That's so, so just here, eh? not, not in Gulf of Mexico, Tilburg here. Uh, but uh, no, no, no physical inspection had taken place until somebody actually found the invoice for the hiring of the high crane that you could that was used precisely to inspect this, so there was no longer any denying. Just two, three weeks before, and it has been inspected, was said it's very dangerous. Nothing happened because the budget wasn't there, because some of my fellow uh, well, neighborhood members, I would almost say, because I live in this nice part of Tilburg, where all the nice people live who also work at the municipality. And then and, and the friendly people, the children go to field hockey, etc. But still, the decision to, to postpone that 495 euros led to the death of that baby. And, and that's a regulating role that was missed there. So, too much collaboration is, uh, uh, is a bad thing. And we think of it, and it is, of course, a great thing. Well, these kids, it uh, looks like they really uh, are justifiably are collaborating very well, but there may be this thing that, that gets too much, that you actually forget, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, but I'm, in the end, uh, it's nice that we get along well, but, but, in, the, but the very, uh, and in 95% of cases, uh, it actually works well, uh, but in those 5%. Oh. Uh, by percentages, eh? the, 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 quite often, and I uh, forgot to put that slide on there, but when you go to a big chemical plant like Shell Mudijk uh, nearby, so you see outside a big sign, no fatal, uh, no major industries for so many days, no, so many, so they're really proud on the number of days that nothing happened. But that says nothing. That's, uh, the, the Taleb uses the comparison with uh, 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 not uh, chicken, turkeys. You know, the, 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 the big chicken that are roasted uh, uh, on Christmas. And if you would, uh, and he said, if you would make a graph of how happy the, and how confident the turkey is in, 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 in uh, in his, uh, in his or her life, and also how much they trust their, uh, their owners, then they will be continuously going up from January all the way until half December. Because for a whole year, they only got great food and were cared for, etc. But it says nothing about what will happen a few days before Christmas. So the whole idea, and this is the problem then, that the longer these things take, the longer the great collaboration is very successful, and the companies make good profit and no, and no incidents are really occurring, the more you think, well, we can relax a little bit. And that's when the drift happens. 
drift from what you first said wasn't allowed. Well, actually, perhaps it isn't so safe. So let's do half of that. Let's not inspect it all the time. Let's expect let's lengthen the inspection interval. Uh, we don't have to go there physically all the time. We also can get there. All these little things that initially were thought to be really important, the longer that things are going well, the more that people are lured into the idea it's actually well and we can collaborate nice and everybody's happy and everybody's making money. That's not ill will, that's not corrupt, that's not sabotage, that's just human behavior, that when things are going wrong or right for a long time, you think it's okay to leave them that way because the likelihood that, that, that Christmas only happens once a year and all the time before that, you're safe, you're happy and everything is, is, is going well. How are we doing on time? Fine. Uh, the 737 uh, Max. This is uh, the, the crash twice. So the 737. We've all flown a 737. This is the new version, the Max. Boeing, one uh, well, together with Airbus, the biggest uh, uh, commercial aircraft uh, aircraft manufacturer, uh, uh, that uh, has sort of the the, the the annual revenue of a smaller uh, country. So really important company. Uh, and when the first 737 crashed, uh, I think it was in Southeast Asia in March, unfortunate but strange, a new plane, and, and there were some talks uh, about uh, the pilots not being able to, to, to actually uh, deal with the plane. When the second one, uh, but, but that sort of subsided soon enough, when the second one crashed, and this was Ethiopia, I think, uh, over a year later, uh, then it was done. Uh, and initially, all this was uh, yeah, a technical accident. Yeah, we don't know what happened. May probably pilot error, actually, because you know these countries and these pilots. And, uh, but gradually, it became clear that at the root of this was a fundamental design flaw. In the redesign of uh, the 737 MAX, uh, the, the distribution of weight in the plane became different. That You could correct that, but you had to correct it by software in the automatic uh, uh, systems uh, of, of uh, taking off and landing and as a result of that, and that could also go wrong and, and it, I would have to look it up what precisely happened but it could go wrong and that was sort of because if you would not if you would say no that's not good enough then would, they would have to redesign the entire plane and that's billions that you then lose and somehow the regulators went along with that a little too long. This was a bit of gray area. Can you compensate one design flaw by having compensating measures in, in, in the software or not? Yeah, well, it's a design flaw. It's a characteristic. It's not a flaw. It's just the plane behaves different. And, and, and for a long time, so the, the, the American aviation authorities went along in retrospect too long, uh, uh, as is now commonly regarded, with uh, the, uh, the, the statements of, of Boeing that they were working on it, that there would be a patch, and, and, the, 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 and, and then the second uh, collapse happened. And for a while, all the uh, 737 MAX planes were grounded, which of course is much more expensive, but very few people died in those, died in those planes in the meantime, but much more expensive than, than, than the original modification, but still. Um, so, too close collaboration. Again, the technical cause, uh, and the collaboration, especially between the regulating uh, authorities and, and the operating authorities. Whoops, that's a bit too fast. So what can you do about this? That's not so easy. That, that's, as I said in the beginning, I will have more question marks in the beginning than I'll have uh, explanation marks. And, and Akil and me, we, we, the, one of the few examples that we see that actually work is whistleblowing. So, blowing the whistle, uh, uh, the Dutch word is, uh, uh, what is the Dutch word anyway? Sorry? Klokkenluider, thank you, yes, klokkenluider. So, the same idea, you make a lot of noise, which alerts people. So, if the regulator and the operator are collaborating too closely, then thankfully we still have all these individuals within the organization that can say, oh, uh, uh, this is really going wrong. I do not, and I first you try it with the regulator, but that doesn't work because they don't see it. And then often they leak to the press. And depending on whistleblowers, uh, our idea towards whistleblowers is kind of ambiguous. Uh, I, uh, in my work, I also collaborated with many industrial organizations, for instance, also with NS. 
And two weeks ago, I met uh, with them and they said, yeah, we have this problem with this whistleblower somewhere. Uh, uh, and and uh, he says, he's saying that we don't have our, uh, uh, our maintenance records in, uh, in order. It was in the big journal in the newspaper. And actually, he's wrong. Now, I don't know if this whistleblower is wrong. I'm pretty sure there are whistleblowers that are wrong. Sure, there are lots of nuts cases in the world. But still, uh, interestingly, I said, yeah, but whistleblowing is good, isn't it? Yes, whistleblowing is good. There was no doubt, yes, whistleblowing in general is good. It's just that this particular one. Now, of course, I don't know if the people in Boeing would have said the same thing. But in general, we agree that it's good that somebody, uh, that, that somebody from their own conscience says, if, if it's clear that the regulating activities don't work. We've had a lot of this with, uh, with Me Too, etc. and... Uh, and uh, uh, with our uh, TV shows on the sexual harassment recently, yeah, that, that when you complain to the people who should about what's happening, to the people who should take care of you, they don't. So the only alternative is to go to the press. Many examples of this. That's an organizational issue. You see how far away we are from corrosion as a result of higher assets and, and, and higher moisture in the, in, the, in the air or terrorist attacks. We're really looking at how people behave in groups, organizational stuff. So... Uh, if uh, the, 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 the idea that, uh, that we are getting uh, so far is that uh, we have found very, that is that accidents will happen. If over time things, the normal stuff goes well, then regulators and operators will always become more and more friendly with each other. It's not as a result of which that the low likelihood thing, the gray swan, or perhaps even, the, well, the gray swan probably, of something that very rarely happens will happen and then disaster will occur and as a result of that uh, action may be taken but can we prevent the disaster then well perhaps only through a whistleblower although uh, we find it very hard to find examples of whistleblowers that actually were believed before a disaster happened and not around or after a disaster happened so there are some counterexamples. This is one. Uh, so here's, here's an example of uh, not a, well, yeah, I call it a call a whistleblower. Anyone knows this is a very part of a very famous picture? The Challenger. Excellent. Sorry, you're an expert. Uh, oops. Uh, there's, this comes from a book, The O-Rings by, uh, I forgot this is the man's name. Anyway, uh, O-Rings. What are O-rings and what's the Challenger? The, cha the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, uh, exploded uh, shortly after launch and you can see some of uh, the, the, the smoke rising from that, killing everybody on board, of course. And the reason was something as simple as that it was chilly that morning. It was cold, technical reason, it was cold. And because it was cold, some of the rubber rings that connect one part of the, of the, the, the rocket, uh, the, uh, the spacecraft, with, with the others, uh, they become less flexible. There's a wonderful uh, picture uh, or a short video of uh, a Nobel Prize winner uh, in physics, is it Feynman, I believe, who, uh, who illustrates this in the hearing for Congress. Uh, where he has an ordinary O-ring, probably something from, uh, from a hardware store or something, and he puts it in ice water for 10 minutes, and then he shows it, shows to the, uh, 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 to the committee that actually it doesn't work anymore. It has lost its elastic uh, capability. Uh, the O-rings were, uh, were part of, of course, of, of, the, of the design uh, done by a subcontractor uh, for, uh, for Boeing, not the main contractor. Um, and they worked perfectly, of course, with every test, but not in cold weather. There was not been a test in really freezing weather. And uh, this, uh, the, the, there was a committee that in the end decides to launch. We now have delayed launches again, again, by, by, uh, uh, of, of the latest uh, project uh, by, uh, uh, for, from NASA, but this was back then. And in that room with six people, in the end, they have to decide, will we do this or not? And this man from the subcontractor uh, said, uh, no, because we do, not know, we do not know if it will work in cold water. That's not the same as saying we know it will not work. Eh? We do not know. It hasn't been tested. And so there was a lot of push on, uh, on, uh, on uh, this man because uh, he had already been delayed. Also, he got phone calls from his 
own boss saying, actually, you know, I just got a phone call from our customer, you know, who's paying his fair, paying his fair, fair his billions, that you're being difficult on this topic, and will you just not, uh, 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 can't you just uh, be a bit more flexible on this? But in the end, the guy wouldn't, he wouldn't sign off, and they went along with it anyway. They went along with it. Next day, of course, a horrible accident. And for a while, uh, the story was everybody agreed on this. Now, we all agreed there was no problem until uh, in the investigation it became clear there was a signature missing. There was a signature. Uh, 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 and, and then gradually it became clear because uh, the guy who wrote it, so after a while, did this story. Um, uh, had been silenced by his own company and wasn't allowed uh, that. So he can be a whistleblower. Of course, he didn't go to the associated to, to, to the big press, etc. But you're disbelieved until it happens, and when it happens, and afterwards, yes, afterwards. So, but whistleblowers, we think, we hope, are very hopeful and should be encouraged more. And perhaps what we can do as society is make the protection for them better. And perhaps also identifying if they're really whistleblowers or just crazy people holding a grudge against the company, because you'll also have that. Uh, but, but that the protection for witness uh, whistleblowers is better. Like we have in, in organized crime, our protection for uh, people who will uh, actually, uh, uh, the, 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 the crime protection, uh, the, the witness protection programs that, that you see uh, in the news uh, and, and in the TV series that when people testify against a major uh, criminal uh, uh, head of, uh, well, some, so some criminal business, then they, then they go through great pains, not just to prevent uh, the, them from uh, being killed, but also to secure that they remain alive long enough to give the testimony. So perhaps we should do more of that. that. We don't know yet, but we are eagerly looking for examples where whistleblowers really made a difference before the disaster happened. But even if it's... Yeah, and, and will then the process stop totally? Will that lead to a situation in which, um, in which there's no longer this gradual buildup of, mista of, of mistaken confidence, this drift into more and more collaboration where it really shouldn't be? Well, that depends on how often, of course, we, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, let those whistleblowers uh, do their thing. Oops. Uh, and... There uh, comes, uh, this, this is a picture that came up in my Google search when I look for uh, 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 men forgetting. So uh, here is somebody forgetting something. I could, of course, easily put a picture of myself up there, but uh, because I tend to forget things as well. Uh, but organizational forgetting uh, is, is, is problematic. That, that's really, uh, that, that's really a, a, a part here. If it's long enough, is sufficiently long enough, will we then, uh, then automatically things, uh, yeah, we, we find it less important. And we've seen that repeatedly, by the way, also because I teach, of course, in the School of Business, many of the boom-bust cycles we've seen <laughs> happened so often uh, before, but every time when they're long enough, then the people who actually push the buttons in the trade rooms or whatever, they weren't around already when the last time hit really big, and so, what do they know? And uh, and this this I've seen this in many businesses, uh, and it keeps. If it's more than a decade ago, it's it's lost. Nobody was there around. Uh, the nice thing about being a researcher, by the way, sometimes I'm. It was a while back. I was called by an, a CEO of an industrial company. Hank, can you come back, please? Because uh, we now have this big challenge. And last time it happened 12 years ago. You and me were the only one who were there. Uh, and perhaps we can explain to, to, to my current board members what actually uh, was happening then and what we did back then. And I did, and then you're sort of an, an external brain pack for the organization because the rest of them, apart from the CEO, had already forgotten about it. So organizational forgetting, it, if, that, if organizations, the longer that they remember that stuff happened, the more likely they are not to make the same mistakes again. So suppose that, that uh, turkeys could live after they were eaten. I know it's a silly example. But uh, that then perhaps next year they would be less uh, confident of, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, of what happened early December. Yeah. Uh, this is another way. 
of uh, uh, making sure that memory stays concrete. This is the Stormvloedkering, the Westerschelde. Uh, I've witnessed this once in this type of weather, and that is great. Uh, we close the Stormvloedkering only once, twice a year, and most of the time for me, just, just to test it. So it rarely is needed. This cost billions, of course, to build. And why? Because over 2,000 people died. Why did they die? Was it because of high tide? No, it was because of people. Because people, yes, because uh, uh, the, the maintenance of the, uh, of the dikes in this region was very, after the post-war period, was very much deferred, very much the state of the condition of the dikes was, was much worse. And so the likelihood that they might fail, a low likelihood, and it hasn't happened in a hundred years, uh, was still there. And because it was so long ago, and because money was scarce, this was the 1950s for uh, uh, 1954, actually, is uh, 53, 54, was, thank you, was the major, uh, was this major uh, um, catastrophe in Zeeland. And because of that, uh, uh, there was very little interest in, in, in keeping everything uh, uh, very uh, well organized. But of course, Afterwards, there was, and 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 I think uh, what you do here is you really pour memory in concrete. So even if the people who designed and built these things are long gone, they are still there. So if we can make changes in our infrastructure that are so long-lasting that actually they will live longer than organizational memory, well, that's good news. I sort of expect that every time from now on that we uh, it should, but I'm interested to see if every time from now on we put uh, critical infrastructure in the sea, that we completely will ignore the possibility of terrorist attacks. That will be interesting, but also pretty bad. By the way, don't forget that we want our entire energy uh, uh, supply to come in 10, 15 years for two thirds from the North Sea uh, from our solar, from our uh, uh, offshore wind, uh, uh, far, wind, uh, wind farms. So will we not, after the events of Grenfell, look at any possibility of securing that there is some sabotage and uh, what we'll do, backup systems? I think we will. But if it takes long enough, then probably the people who designed it will have left, but hopefully the structures are still there. So this could be a way, making it more... Uh, uh, really uh, uh, lengthening the period in which you're s sort of safe by, by actually uh, 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 ingraining it into the physical infrastructure. And, and, and here's my last suggestion, training. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's not forget that in, 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 uh, the, the war is very infrequent. We have one now. We had one in the Second World War. We had had in Europe one in, in Yugoslavia, uh, but the military train every week, train every day for this event. Uh, firemen train every day. They keep practicing, uh, aware of some like the likelihood that your or my place will burn down is very small. The likelihood that and no uh, uh, buildings here in the Netherlands uh, will burn down is very low indeed. In fact, yesterday I got a warning message that at the Nemostraat there was a big fire. So, and of course there are uh, tens of thousands of buildings uh, in, in, in Tilburg, so uh, any of them has a really small likelihood, but the collective likelihood of it is pretty high. So you could say, yeah, of course they're training because there's a fire every time. Yeah, yeah, so that's the problem, that if the more unique this becomes, the more difficult it is to train for it. But then perhaps training and remaining aware of that something may happen and always be on the lookout for that, a bit paranoid, you could say, is, uh, uh, is perhaps better, although I don't know, perhaps the Turkey had a lovely life and uh, not concerned by anything until the final X came. And, and if being paranoid would still have been, I don't know, I know. But in the context of critical infrastructures, I think training, making sure that, that you over invest in, uh, in safety and finding ways of limiting this organizational drift and this organizational forgetting, promoting uh, uh, whistleblower activities, all these things together may perhaps make our world a little bit safer and then still 
of course, this big, uh, uh, still we may have somebody in a submarine or in a boat and, uh, and doing something we had never thought of. So I suppose in the end, the uh, question of the, the, the Nord Stream, uh, could we have prevented that? Uh, I think not, but perhaps in coming years, I will be, uh, uh, that, that we get more information that actually we could have, but we didn't because of some organizational reason. So that's my presentation, my story. Questions? Yes, all right, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Anyone? No, it was a very uh, interesting lecture, right? Maybe no questions came up? No? I, I do have a question that I uh, thought about uh, when I heard your, uh, your talk just now. Um, you hear a lot of um, these days about data-driven decision-making and about also AI um, in the future or even now already making big decisions, right? What do you think of that in regards to your story? Is that a good movement or should we also be very wary of that because then we are maybe also even not like yeah we're not taking action in our own hand in our own hands right we're also shifting away the responsibility then again or yeah what do you think yeah of well, that? well um, um, indeed uh, decision making becomes much more data driven and in the sense that, that that we can now collect more information more widely and better that is better. However, uh, it doesn't really change things because uh, the, the, the problem is still that, that we are looking at something which is very unlikely to happen. And, and, and uh, how can you search for all these hundreds of gray swans in, in your, it's still an attitude that you need to have. So just, uh, the, the, and, 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 and these systems can also have problems. Uh, very f one example, we had uh, uh, an example, an environmental example, we keep forgetting them, which, which is sad because they worked. Uh, remember that, that the, uh, uh, what's, what's that called? Um, uh, what you, uh, the spray that you get from, uh, from all sorts of uh, spraying devices contained uh, uh, a gas. And, and as a result of that, the ozone layer uh, started to disappear. Sorry that I don't have the, uh, the English terminology at hand. Um, now, where did that hole in the ozone layer suddenly come from? Because suddenly there was a hole as big as France in the ozone layer near, near, the, near the poles. Well, that ozone layer was routinely monitored uh, through, over across Earth. Only the, the thing is, because of the data issue, whenever they would have no measurement, the algorithm says, let's take the measurement of the nearest thing next to it. And of course, that was meant for small holes in, uh, in, in data that somehow, I don't know, uh, uh, a pigeon flew over the, the satellite. I don't know, super, uh, but some, uh, so some data incompleteness. But after a while, the algorithm did that for this whole hole the size of, uh, of France. And so after a while, a human, so actually, and we talk 1980s here, so this is not... Uh, uh, a, a human actually noticed this, and, 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 and as a result of that, we became very alarmed by ozone layer. And as a result of that, we banned the use of these particular uh, uh, gases uh, in, uh, in our uh, uh, deodorants, etc. So, uh, coming back to your question, well, AI and data-driven decision-making still has implicit bias. It's not good, it's not bad, it's a fact of life. It's very convenient that... Uh, the way every day your and my day is full of AI and uh, whenever we try to figure out uh, 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 where is something happening or where do I go to or who actually said this or so, we use AI all the time. Um, our cars are full of AI uh, and, and that's very convenient and automatically they see all sorts of things and sometimes they're very stupidly wrong. So. I think but I see AI in this case as a, very, as a special case of technology. It makes things more difficult. And more and more is it important that you understand what that actually is doing. So the, uh, the Air France flight that, that collapsed uh, completely 
uh, that fell into the sky uh, of Brazil uh, was an example where the pilots didn't really understand what the safety regulation systems were doing. But uh, now I'll have another example. Uh, sorry, I have so many aerospace examples today. Uh, but, but still, uh, they are very well documented and, and whistleblowing and, and accident uh, analysis is very well developed in the aerospace case. But we had in the Netherlands, we had uh, uh, a decade or so ago, we had a, a plane from Turkish Airlines falling out of the sky near Schiphol. I believe the, 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 the cost in human life was limited. But the reason was there was an error in the, in the, uh, in the systems that actually had to calculate the height of the, uh, of the plane. And, and the, 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 um, uh, the pilots knew that, so they ignored that there was the wrong height on the plane. Actually, but at the same time, they, what they didn't know was at a certain height automatically to help the pilots, the uh, flaps would come out and, and, and the, 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 the landing wheels would come out, preparing the plane to land. And so here they were flying at uh, 300 meters and the system said it, it's uh, 80 meters or something like that. And the flaps came out and, and, and they simply fell off the sky. So the problem is with more and more technology, the AI driven or, or, or all this kind of control stuff, uh, that the control system may also be wrong. And then you need the human again. And we need to do more and more of that. Uh, and we can. We get used to this. We could look at to how you and me use our iPhones and we'd find several examples where we know that's probably wrong, but we ignore it because we know the device is wrong. And 10 seconds later, we use it and we trust it blindly because we know probably this time is right. That would be my long answer to your simple short question. All right, thank you. Did any other questions come up in the meantime? Yeah? Um, there's a lot of research into these big disasters and a lot of reports and, and, and learning. Uh, does it actually help to prevent uh, next dis disasters? Is there, well, uh, sort of numbers uh, of, of... Yeah, well, in many industries, it flattens out. So uh, this is true for the aerospace and for the process industries that start aerospace, of course, if you, that if you start these, these statistics in, in, the, in the war period, then of course they're there, but, but shortly after, so fewer and fewer planes actually collapse and fewer and fewer major chemical incidents actually occur, but it flattens out. There, there is this, this level then that, that, that perhaps we find the example of, uh, that we can't solve and that's probably because then we've got all the usual suspects and we've got all the obvious things that you go wrong. So if you go and visit a, a shell facility of BP facilities and, and you have a sandwich and you're walking there in the cantina with your, and you don't keep and you take the stairs, you don't put your hand on the railing, they will say, and a stranger will come to you, please do your hand on the railing, whereas the likelihood that something will explode is please. But that's really in the culture, they've, they've got that. So very few people will actually fall down or break a leg uh, because they don't keep their hand to the railing. But the more complex ones, the one that's many interactions of very low likelihoods. We had uh, uh, at, uh, at Shell Mudaik, we had two major incidents some, some five, six, seven, eight years ago. One was an example where a new piece of equipment was used and they wanted to start it up, a new kraker. Uh, uh, and used the way that they used it in the, did that in the past, but that collapsed and, 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 and uh, fortunately uh, uh, nobody died. Also luckily because there was a shift uh, change and so nobody was outside, but huge pieces of uh, equipment were flying around. And another one was also, this was also in the news, where uh, uh, one of these uh, exhaust uh, uh, valves had actually been open and some toxic material had been flowing out for weeks and months until they finally found out. And then it turned out that the person who should have checked that hadn't done it, but had said yes, and the person who should have checked him actually said yes too. These two people were fired, but the whole idea of close collaboration and as a result of that, uh, because of course all the time uh, these things are closed, uh, no doubt they've done that for 500 times and every time, and now they forgot. And, you know, it's probably all right. Uh, so uh, they do help, but they help to a certain extent. They do not get uh, the helpers with the gray and black swans. 
that uh, there we need organizations and, and, and constant alert, but, but many of these rules and regulations that come up as a result of these analysis also improve designs, of course. Eh? If, if there is a technical reason for this, the 737 is redesigned. It may collapse in different ways, but not longer in the way that we had before. So it helps, but to a point. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think we have to end it there because it's already quarter to six. Uh, thank you very much. And please give a big applause for Hank Ackerman. Thank you.